Okay, so uh, recently we've been celebrating the fact that it's been 10 years since Martin Langhoff came and taught some of us how to write Moodle code in November 2005. And almost 10 years since our first course was released on Moodle. Um, and we've also completed a comprehensive review of our VLE in the last few months. And so when I was asked to come and speak to you guys, it seemed like a good opportunity to share our current thinking and reflect on those 10 years. But as it turns out, as I did my research for this, there was a keynote from April 2010 Moodle Moot in the UK entitled A Brief History of Moodle at the OU by Ross McKenzie, who's headed our learning systems team at the OU for the majority of those 10 years. So I will try not to cover too much of the same ground as he did. What I'm going to do is talk about what we've done over the 10 years, the kinds of projects that we've delivered either through Moodle or integrated with Moodle, um, and the learning tools that we've created along the way. Then we'll take a little look at how we've done that and uh, the way we've worked with the Moodle community, for example. Feedback shows us that one of the most interesting things about the OU is the scale of our, our systems. So I'll try to give you an idea about how we cope with our big numbers. And all along, I'll try to highlight the things that we've learned. Some stuff has worked well, and we've stuck with it over the whole 10 years. Other things have been a less than positive experience, and uh, so we've learned and changed along the way. One thing that Ross said five years ago was that your VLE is never finished, um, and that still holds true today. Uh, so I will end by covering some of our hopes and plans for the future. But right now, let's pop into the DeLorean and head back in time, right to the very beginning. And back at the start of our, our days with M Moodle, um, it was all about a direct replacement for print. We had a study calendar and our first Moodle module, which was called Resource Pages, and this allowed us to hang uh, PDF files and Word documents, versions of printed course materials. Um, and in this way, we presented our first fully online courses in 2008. Back then, using Moodle in itself was seen as innovative, and we were experimenting with core tools such as Forum, Blog, and Wiki. But we did integrate a few tools of our own. So we had an existing in-house Java-based question engine called OpenMark, which we still have today and still use for our most complex question types. Of course, our definition of complex has changed over the years. So where we've seen question types come up again and again in OpenMark, we've turned those into question types in the Moodle quiz so that anyone can use them without the need for a Java programmer. And another early module was My Stuff. This is an e-portfolio system allowing users to create collections of work or learning materials, perhaps for a CV. It is still in use, um, but it is being uh, switched off and decommissioned. Um, basically, we think there are other tools in the marketplace now which will, will do the same, serve the same use, um, and indeed some of the other Moodle modules, depending on the learning outcome that's required. So 2006 was my personal start with Moodle with the launch of our open line sites. These were funded by the Hewlett Foundation as part of their open content in initiative. This introduced two new Moodle sites, Learning Space, the green one, and Lab Space, the purple one. Le Learning Space is all around um, quality assured OU study materials and providing them for free as part of our widening participation remit. Whereas Lab Space allowed anyone to create open educational resources around the world. So let's move us on in time just a little bit. And we went through a, a period of significant scaling up. Structured content module, which some of my colleagues presented earlier on, was one of the key foundations of our ability to deliver more and more online. Uh, this screenshot shows that uh, uh, how it works. Basically, users edit XML in a text editor or um, something like XML Spy, and then we render it into HTML or indeed into print formats. Um, and you can include rich text, rich assets like audio, video, um, interactives like Flash, and now HTML5, and uh, also little short self-assessment questions like these ones shown here. And that's much more usable and obviously much more flexible and is now the standard way that we deliver our course materials to students. Around this time, we also wrote quite a lot of reports so that I, our staff could see the way that students were interacting with courses and get to understand exactly how they were using the different new tools. And that, along with um, some standard 
layout guidance and some workflows allowed us to roll out consistent courses to every single presentation. And we started to connect up to lots and lots of other learning tools. We replaced first class with an OU written forum tool within module. Now there's a bit of an in-joke here, for, particularly for the Trekkies. We called our tool uh, Forum NG for next generation and the icon was a little green man or possibly a little red man. Oh, I'm not a Trekkie. Right? The red, men, red shirted men are the ones that die, so I was, as was the other way around. I'm not sure which. Um, we also integrated uh, Illuminate in replacement of our homegrown audio video conferencing tool and piloted with Second Life. For both of those, we used community modules in order to bridge to those systems. There was a research project called Buddy Space, written by our Knowledge Media Institute, which we initially launched in Lab Space. This allowed um, online presence and chat. And we rolled that out into Learning Space a little while later. But unfortunately, as a research project, it, when it, that project ended, its uh, support for the tool rather dried up. And so we never made it into uh, Core VLE. And we, indeed, we had to remove it from OpenLearn in the end. Now, the little shock horror face is uh, one of the indications you'll see throughout these slides of uh, things that we don't want to do ever again. And version control in lab space it was the cause of some of my grey hairs. We initially, we allowed people to just take a clone of a Moodle site, uh, did a backup and restored it so that they had their own personal version to edit in. But we wanted to roll that out to a much more collaborative experience. And then we added on top of that um, tools that you would expect to see in something like SharePoint or um, Documentum. So you could keep a record of who changed what, when and why, and roll back if you wanted to. That, along with a comparison, for example, if you changed the page content or the structure of a forum or a, uh, a wiki, was a very, very complex piece of code to write. And indeed, one of my developers nearly walked halfway through that project. So that is something we definitely wouldn't do again. Um, and in the end, we actually rolled that back so that now we don't have any of that extra version control, but we allow people to collaborati collaboratively edit and expect them to sort out their own differences if they don't like um, what each other are doing in the site. And that's not all. Around this time, we started writing an audio recording tool. We've had various versions of that now, which allow students on language courses, for example, to share snippets of them speaking. And we had a system called Shared Activities, which allowed groups of, to, of users to form around a forum or a wiki. And that would be a select group outside of a course context. That's something that we've just switched off recently. And off the back of the success of, of OpenLearn, we were asked to create Moodles for other people as well. In this case, this is a CPLD course for healthcare professionals providing training in personality disorders. So moving to, on in time again, a little further to 2010, when Ross was standing here, we had just conducted a review of whether Moodle was the right tool for the job before we moved across to Moodle 2. And I'll talk a little bit more about our experience with that migration later on. We took the opportunity, though, to uplift the graphic design. So what you see here is uh, a, a, a new version of the theme where course teams had a little bit of extra flexibility so they could change a colour from a, a small palette and they could control which image went up there at the top. Also around this time, we added a significant amount of personalisation. You've got the completion checkboxes there, which allow either people to mark off for themselves how they're progressing, or perhaps that's automated sometimes, depending on the activity. And in the bottom left-hand corner of my slides, you can see there a mock-up of a note-making tool that, again, we've since retired, but that allowed people to make notes directly in the study planner and the course um, homepage. This was also the time when we started to dabble in mobile. So we created a desktop theme, which is the, the big one you see, but also one focused on phones and one focused on tablets. And those offered just a limited functionality set. So I'll just take a quick detour from my timeline to talk about mobile, because this is the time when we started logging all of the data about what systems people were using, what devices they were using. And one thing that we noticed and still notice is that OU students tend to be very Apple-focused, um, despite changes in market share over time. 
They have, however, followed typical market trends around using tablets coming to the fore in 2012 and decreasing rapidly recently, which we assume is a result of people who now have the larger smartphone screens and are making a decision between laptop and phone rather than desktop, laptop, tablet and phone. Uh, the other thing that we have noticed has, has stayed common across the entire period is the kinds of activity people do on their mobile devices, which tends to be very much that kind of small, discrete actions like reading forum posts rather than in-depth study. So getting back to my timeline, as well as moving the main VLE into Moodle 2, we actually split it into three separate sites. So one of them holds course presentation websites, then there's a second uh, student-facing system for non-course materials, like study guides or the student union forums. And there's a third for staff materials, such as workspaces and staff training. This has its good and bad points. Multiple sites are much harder to keep in sync, for example, with student profiles. Um, and also, it means three times the work when we want to upgrade anything. It's also quite confusing for students, the port navigation is relatively poor between them and my technical colleagues would tell me you just shouldn't do this ever again. But from a system administration point of view it's much easier to configure the roles and permissions across the three sites, focusing on the different kinds of audiences for the materials, so my business colleagues are much more on the fence. So OpenLearn also had to move up to Moodle 2 and again took that opportunity for a rebrand and a, a, a redesign. And as well as um, the learning space being updated, it merged with a Drupal site which holds smaller learning objects created around BBC broadcasts. And that's the cause of my second lot of grey hairs and another developer threatening to leave. It was a horrible, horrible integration. It's very much two-way. There are things that happen first in Moodle and then need to be pushed into Drupal and then there are other things that happen in Drupal first and have to be pulled back into Moodle so it's an, it's an absolute hairball to unpick. In the screenshot what you can see in the bottom left hand corner is Moodle so that's a structured content document but it could be a quiz or a forum activity and the whole of the rest of the page the navigation the user profiles the tags the comments all of that's dr driven through Drupal. That's a bit of a mess, really, and uh, certainly now we would do that, and we're looking to moving that back into a pure Moodle site. Um, we've learnt over the years um, that you can do small learning objects within Moodle as well as the bigger courses. So moving on in time again, things settled down quite a bit, and our focus turned towards syndicating our content out. We talked earlier on in, in other presentations about structured content and our use of the transformation engine to provide course materials in a range of different formats according to either the student choice or perhaps to be sold on to other organisations through our business development unit. So we create, for example, Word or PDF, SCORE, MyMS con content packaging, um, and of course EPUB and Kindle for people to consume on their mobile devices. Another approach to syndicating out our content is by bringing in co cohorts of students into our VLE on their own branded experience. So in this case, we have a partnership with the NHS Leadership Academy to provide staff training to nurses. Um, and they're actually in the same environment as everybody else, but they see a different header and footer. And we've done that for a number of different courses now, a number of different programmes. This kind of time period, around 2013, also represents our first experience with LTI, Learning Tools Interoperability, where, which we used to bring Vitalsource in, providing access to set books online as well for the first time. At the same time as we did all of our work to move to Moodle 2, we kicked off a thing called the Roadmap Acceleration Programme to deliver a wide range of innovations, and they took um, a few years to come to fruition. So this is the period when all of those went live. Um, note the branding, they're all OU something or other. I nearly called this slide OU everything, actually. Um, the idea was that we could change the technology underneath without having to confuse students by changing the names of the tools. But that's something that we're moving away from again now, going back to calling a spade a spade rather than, say, OU digging. So just to skim through these, OU Annotate is the bottom right-hand corner. 
That's a web annotation tool which allows you to do with uh, online materials what would you would normally do in a printed text with post-it notes or with a highlighter pen. Bottom left-hand corner is OU Anywhere. That's our mobile app for reading course content. We have Blackboard Collaborate, which is branded as OU Live. We integrated Stack for maths assessment, and we've used Open Badges for both OpenLearn and some staff informal certification. And we have an iTunes U channel, or at least that's to say we did because that's still closed. That, that's closed down recently. And Annotate, which I know some of you have, have asked me about before, um, that's not in active promotion or development at the moment because it's had quite low take up with students. And we also started leveraging that shiny new Moodle 2 environment to create a few extra Moodle installations for other audiences. The Open Science Lab allows free access to a range of different science experiments. And that was funded by the Wolfson Foundation and is still ongoing. Whereas VITAL, which was funded by the Department of Ed Education and is basically open learn for teachers, providing teacher training and sharing of resources, turned out to be less than VITAL and uh, has now closed. This is also the time when uh, there were some changes in higher education funding, bringing in student loans, which were very much focused on qualification registration. And so we created our Quals Online site to provide students with a home when they were between courses and also to provide them with information about uh, general information around the subject that they're studying rather than specific to the course. That's still running and we're thinking of new and better ways to provide them with that kind of experience which may or may not be in Moodle in future, we just don't know, but it'll certainly integrate with it. And that brings us almost up to date. Some of my colleagues earlier on were presenting on our online student experience program, OSEP, which has gone through that review of the VLE and confirmed Moodle as our platform of choice again for the next few years. And we've taken the opportunity to have a third redesign. So here now we see our most recent uplifted theme. This is a responsive design, so we don't have to maintain the phone and the tablet versions anymore. It's a much less cluttered user interface and the colour choice is gone. You can have it in blue or blue, but you do still get to control the image at the top. Last year, we also worked on conditional availability for activities, allowing people to create much more flexible pathways through course materials based on combinations of criteria, whether that's grade in a quiz, group membership, date, whatever, for a more personalised experience based on their interest or their ability. And through OSEP, we've been looking at rationalising our tool set. That's basically about not flogging a dead horse. And I've touched on some of those things that we've switched off as I've gone along. But our aim is to streamline our tools on a few more distinct options so that we can provide uh, better support to our users and make those smaller set of tools of higher quality. And our choices on which ones to keep and which ones to focus our attention on are driven through activity levels and analytics. We have, however, introduced one new module, and that's the Open Design Studio. Uh, this was a standalone project uh, used in a small number of course teams and has now been rewritten as a Moodle module. It's basically Pinterest for learning. Uh, it reflects, uh, mimics a bricks and mortar design studio where you can show off your work, comment on other people's, and basically get critical feedback. And lots of course teams are showing interest in this and some of which come quite a long way away from its origins as a photography or a technology course, with financial courses, for example, wanting to share even spreadsheets. And we clearly didn't have enough Moodles yet, so we brought in two more. Our offender learning site is a walled garden for prisoners, where they have uh, basically exactly the same experience as in the main student-facing VLE, but with additional authentication, where each a uh, student has a unique PIN number that is only known to the prison staff. And also there is, is limited collaboration, limited uh, ability to contact others so that they can't organise their breakout by Moodle messaging. <laughs> and the online exam system is still in pilot. The, the theory behind that is that it allows students to type their exams off in the uh, Moodle quiz using a locked down browser rather than having to handwrite everything. Um, we've done a lot of work on local storage of answers in case of uh, Wi-Fi disruption at the exam venue, for example, with that. 
So that's brought us up to date, um, and I'll start to, to talk about how we've achieved all of that. And despite the fact that I interviewed someone earlier this week who claimed to be a magician in his spare time, you don't need a magic wand. It's actually fairly obvious and fairly simple, and if you've been on any business change programs or any change management courses, you'll have heard them talk about people, process, and technology. And so that's what I'm going to talk about now. Back at the start, our development team was very small. In fact, about half of us are in the room, I think. Um, we had about six developers rising to a dozen over the first few years, along with one or two testers. And we now have around 20 developers, plus a supporting cast of project managers, business analysts, and systems architects. We had lots, and still do have lots, of what we now call online services staff, the people who use the Moodle course editing permissions to set up sites. But right from the beginning, and still now, we see the Moodle community as very important. In fact, some of the key things that we wanted right at the start were done by funding other people who were much more experienced than us, either Catalyst or Moodle HQ directly. So, for example, the Moodle um, 1.7 roles and permissions changes were our fault, the accessibility impro improvements, and we also investigated whether we could uh, run on Microsoft SQL Server. And you'll find that uh, we're very active in the uh, developer forums and in the chat. Um, and we give a lot back to the community as well these days. So Tim Hunt is the uh, core maintainer for the quiz engine. And Sam Marshall looks after the conditional activities and completion. Over the years, we've seen that almost half of our developers have committed code into Moodle core. And about half a dozen of them do every single year. Now, I wonder how many people here were at any of the Moodle moots that we ran in Milton Keynes. We hosted two, actually, in these early days, before the community got too big to fit into our lecture halls and meeting rooms. Over time, a fourth role came into prominence, that of an evangelist. In 2010, Ross stood here and said that you have to keep selling, and that still holds true. There's a definite need to evangelize to course teams and to students about the tools that we've created and to aid their adoption. And he also said that people keep coming up with good ideas. And that holds true. There are still new things that we want to try. And so that evangelist role has grown over the years, and we now have a large technology-enhanced learning team, both shaping our learning tools and encouraging their adoption. As well as the broad approach to our people remaining consistent across the 10 years, most of our process is also consistent. We deploy in quarterly releases in March, June, September and December, and we spend several months in development, then a month of acceptance testing before going live. We have tried to change that pattern. I'm not really sure how clearly this graph is showing for you, but just get the general impression of busyness. We were looking for quiet patches. The vertical bars show where we have lots of courses opening and starting, and the horizontal ones show where we have exam periods or other kinds of online assessment. Trying to find a quiet spot in all of that proved to be nigh on impossible, and so we've ended up going back to sticking with uh, three or four releases a year. One of the other things that's remained consistent across the time has been the way we've got our users, courses and groups into the... Uh, Moodle database, and that's done through what we call data load, or architecturally speaking, you might hear it talked about as copy management or ETL, extract, transform, and load. And that's something that we have just bulk exported everything and dumped it in the database and continue to do so. One thing has changed, though. It's the shock horror symbol again. Back in the early days, we were always in a rush to get functionality before our users. Sounding a little bit like Freddie Mercury, I want it all and I want it now. Uh, we regularly went live with beta releases of Moodle. Even really complicated changes were backported, like the quiz engine in Moodle 1.9 into earlier versions that we were still running. And this is definitely not a good idea. It's a bit like I'm picking a hairball. You can never work out every single thing that you need to, you need to copy back. And so it's very error prone and something that we stopped doing as we moved to Moodle 2. So let's talk about our move to Moodle 2 in a little bit more detail. By 2010, we had over 2,000 changes to core Moodle. Some of them were huge, some of them were just one line. And we knew that that approach was something that we couldn't continue with. 
because it was very painful for us to be able to keep in line with, uh, with Moodle releases. So instead, we decided to uh, embrace the growing number of Moodle plugins that were available, um, and so everything we did became a plugin. Now, obviously, that was a really significant piece of work for us, so we drafted in some support in the form of extra contractors on campus and also by outsourcing some of our work to other Moodle development teams. So, for example, Catalyst converted some of our core modules for us and Lunds did some of the more experimental new, mo new modules. Along the way, we created a couple more environments in our route to live. So we have a functional test space which allows us to ensure that requirements are met before going into the acceptance per test period and that then can focus on hunting out any regressions and bugs that we've caused along the way. And we've created an upgrade test environment which not only gives us a quick route to live if we need to patch any bugs while we're testing one of those bigger deployments, but also means that we can test the actual database upgrade goes through smoothly just before doing it on the live system. And recently, um, another of my colleagues here today was talking about a continuous, continuous integration system um, which is running every day now to make sure that all of our code is, is, is up to scratch. So what did we end up with? Well, there are now only 20 core customizations, roughly, in, in, uh, in our code base, so that's a big success. But we do have over 240 plugins and sub-plugins. About half of those reflect all those other Moodles that I talked about earlier on. So what we've done is encapsulate their unique functionality and their configuration inside a plugin so that we can enable it separately, and switch them on and off and treat them differently without having to maintain multiple different code bases. The graph on the left shows the way that our plugins have grown over time. It's pretty steady state, really, with just a few new ones adding in each release and a few dropping out. And the big peak around Moodle 2.4 was when we ported all of the open learn activity across. The pie chart on the right shows all of the different plugin types that we've used. I was sitting listening to Davo earlier on talking about all of the different plugin types, and I think we might have one of everything. The biggest ones are uh, local plugins, modules, blocks, question types, and reports. So if you look at our core student-facing system, we've got about 100 plugins running in that. About a third of those are to do with automating things, providing workflows, standardizing stuff, bulk loading bulk loading everything. So it's helping us to cope with the scale of the number of users that we have. And then about a sixth are monitoring tools. So for example, we have one to integrate with Nagios to make sure that we've got a good availability and good performance in the site. And about 10% of them help us connect to other learning tools that sit around the VLE. Do we have too many? Well, perhaps that's something we can discuss over dinner later. I'm sure everyone will have a view. Um, personally, I think that this just shows how amazingly flexible Moodle can be. And if they come with automated tests, there's really not that significant an overhead in maintaining all of them. So that's people and process. But when I look back over particularly the first five years of our experience with Moodle, and I looked at the blogs and podcasts that we'd written, the thing I noticed the most was the domination of our concerns with performance. One of my colleagues colourfully described this period as performance whack-a-mole. So every time we thought we'd fixed a problem, we found another one. And it's a time when we rapidly learnt how to use JMeter to load test. And we now have a bank of background activity scripts which allow us to roughly simulate an ordinary day on the VLE at any point in time so that we can test every release to make sure that it's uh, performing reasonably well. So when Ross stood here in 2010, he said he'd learned that there was always another bottleneck. I think what we say now is that things have settled down considerably and we can do sort of cost-benefit analysis on whether we need to fix an issue or when performance is just good enough. By the time we moved to Moodle 2, we had five web servers. We were on Postgres database and one file store. Um, and we tend to find that it's the web servers that you need to keep adding, and that's not changed over time. Where are we now? Well, these are some of our latest statistics on the numbers of students and activities that we see, either average or peak. 
October is a peak period for when the majority of our courses open, so that's when we always see the highest levels of traffic throughout the entire year. And in order to achieve all of those big numbers, we've just upgraded all of our web servers to Red Hat 7 and moved from 8 to 12 web servers. Now, that's just for the one Moodle that runs the course presentation websites. Each of the other Moodles that we've talked about as I've gone along have maybe two, maybe four web servers each of their own depending on what kinds of traffic levels they individually see. So if I'd put a little box on that slide for every single web server we run, there wouldn't have been any space left on the slide. I did try. And I should just say that we haven't switched our Moodle 1.9 site off yet either, but we hope to real soon now. Um, basically, it's still there to provide access to old learning materials for some of our students. And that really brings us to what comes next. So this screenshot is, about, is uh, from our direct authoring, Proof of Concept. I see Sam grinning at the back. <laughs> it's his work. Um, this is about allowing a quicker route to live for content so that we can make changes to course materials a lot easier. Um, essentially, you're still editing XML, but in an, a WYSIWYG fashion inside the VLE, which allows us still to connect to that transformation engine, create all those lovely accessible and alternative formats that we've always rolled out. Um, in order to achieve that, we're just offering quite a limited tag set at the moment, though we hope to make it more complex over time. We've got a tender out at the moment for the next generation of our collaboration tool. Will we replace uh, Blackboard Collaborate? I don't know yet. We'll just have to see. And we're also looking at using more of the core plugins uh, rather than writing our own in future. So we're piloting workshop and assignment with small course groups just to get some feedback on whether they work for them. And we have a new media player that we're introducing across the entirety of the OU estate, so you'll have the same look and feel, the same experience, whether you're on the course prospectus, in OpenLearn, in the library, or on your course presentation site. That's got some um, additional usability, it's got some additional accessibility, like synchronous transcripts in there, and it supports a wide range of AV formats. Looking a little further into the future, um, you might be surprised to see some of these. You'd think we'd have nailed search by now and single user profile, but as it turns out, things are a little bit not joined up um, and not terribly reliable, so we'd really like to do those better. And then there's a whole raft of, of requirements that have a definite MOOC influence to them. Uh, so we'd like to do in-page discussions, so we could have a forum alongside the learning materials. We'd like to improve on the progress indicators so people can see how far they are through study materials. And if you're playing buzzword bingo, we'd like to bring in more learning analytics. Um, we see that as really key to guiding decision-making on OU strategy as a whole. So, for example, we've recently launched a SaaS-based digital engagement dashboard for all of our tutors which takes in information from Moodle logs and a load of other places so that tutors have a much better picture of where their students uh, are in their courses and hopefully we can pick up the ones that are at risk of failing or dropping out and doing something about that a little bit sooner. Now we often get um, asked to uh, provide our course materials to other people um, and so that's what the uh, VLE in a box is all about. It's about wanting to spin up uh, course exports or indeed instances of VLEs for other people so that we can bring in that funding to the OU with as little outlay on our, on our part as possible. Um, and finally, when I was a student, I got lots of books and I took notes on paper and I scribbled in the margins and all that stuff and nearly 20 years on, my books are in the loft. And our students, even though their learning is online and it's collaborative, they still want that experience. They still want to keep their learning. So the student archive is a way for us to explore what's the best way to achieve that for them. And from a process and technology point of view, well, to quote one of my other favourite movies, the world moves pretty fast. And if you don't stop and look around once in a while, you might miss out. The pace of change is now so fast that we don't think we can wait another five years to review whether Moodle is the right tool or not. We expect to do some due diligence around that probably every two years in future. And there are a group of things we want to do around speeding up the student experience. So there's a lot in the forums at the moment around PHP 7. 
and claiming some performance wins. We'd like to check those out with our own system and decide when's the right time for us to move to PHP 7. Interestingly, Ross stood here five years ago and said, we're going to look at cloud hosting, but I really mean it this time. We actually have a big project underway at the OU to move as many of our systems onto either platform or infrastructure as a service over the next year or so, and it's possible that the VLE will be a part, one of those that moves. Don't know yet. We'd like to look at using uh, CDNs, more content delivery networks, because our Moodle is now full of so many more rich assets, documents, videos, and such like, and we want a better way of delivering those out to students so that they load really quickly at their end. By continuous de um, deployment, continuous delivery, I don't mean that kind of Facebook like it changes on an almost daily basis underneath you, because our students probably don't want that, and certainly our support staff don't want to have to keep writing all of the materials uh, up on a daily basis and roll out new guidance. What I actually mean is deploying with less downtime. So perhaps it's sometimes referred to as blue-green or AB deployment. It's a way of keeping the system running, keeping people able to contribute in forums while we update the database behind the scenes. So if anybody else is interested in doing that, I'd really love to hear from anyone who's working on it. And finally, we'd like to use some more integrations. Uh, so we're looking at, at uh, seeing Moodle as a spine a little bit more, using LTI and other integration points to put best of breed or other learning tools around our system. And elsewhere in the OU, we're using uh, SOA, Service Oriented Architecture, a lot more to integrate our systems together. So we'd like to finally move away from that copy management approach to getting information out of our student information systems and use SOA in order to uh, get all that into our Moodle database. And that would, of course, have the added advantage that if a student registers late, they change their name, they move courses, move tutor groups, that they would have a much more instantaneous change in the VLE as a result, rather than having to wait for an overnight load. So that brings me to the end. Um, I'll, I'll let people take questions, but I would just say at this point, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants up here. I've just been one of the lead developers that have delivered all of this. There's a whole bunch of people down the back there that know the detail of this stuff way better than I do. So I might just kind of throw some of the questions at them or, or refer you to talk to them later on. So, um, where's the microphone? We have it down the end there. Does anybody have any questions? And again, as with all the other sessions, if you can give your name and your institution just before you ask the question, please. It has to be one question. Do they all want to go to dinner? <laughs> there we go. Um, hello, I'm, I'm Anne Tupman. Um, CVQO is our organisation. Um, it's quite a small organisation, but... Um, my, my question is, do, do you have any sort of guidelines on how you um, put together your distance learning courses that you could make available to other people? We do have guidelines that we use for internal staff that say, you know, a course should look like this, it should have this kind of information, it should be laid out like this, this and this. Um, we've not shared that before. I'm kind of trying to catch the eyes of the people that do it up the back to get a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I'll, I'll point them out to you later on so you can have more of a chat about that. Moodle and blended learning and distance learning, and it'd be, be nice if we had some sort of yeah, advice from you, really, about yeah, the guy. Yeah, sure. Great, thank you. I'd be happy to talk to you later. Anybody else got a question? It's a good sign, you are quite clear then. Go down. A question Go. in the end here, hold on. There's another one over that side. He's gone that side. There was a. a <laughs> you just speak it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please meet you, Sean Gilligan, founder of Web Anywhere. What's the collaboration, shared pra practice, and um, knowledge transfer between sort of FutureLearn and the OU? What's the relationship like, like there? I was sort of curious. I. I put, I left FutureLearn out on purpose. Actually, um, it's not a Moodle site, and it's run by. Um, effectively a separate company, a separate organisation funded by the OU. 
Um, so they've built their own environment in order to provide that. Um, we did provide them with information, guidance, and indeed the course materials and that XML way of editing feeds FutureLearn as well. But other than that, they're purposefully quite separate in order to um, protect the student-facing systems. Hi there, uh, Dave Bolch from Oxford Uni. Uh, I was wondering, with you um, obviously doing a lot of work for um, running Moodles for other people, so like the prisons ones and that sort of stuff, how does that fit on a sort of hosting versus partnership um, sort of relationship? So in most cases, that's, uh, we're doing all of the hosting. Um, it's something that we're thinking about, whether we could, uh, we could get other people to do some of that hosting for us, maybe working through some of the Moodle partners, not sure, um, because actually it's quite a heavy load for us to keep all of those servers up to date. Um, but the main way we achieve it is through keeping the same code base across all of them, so that, that it's sort of as little work as possible. Thanks. Uh, Michael Hughes, University of Strathclyde. It's not really a question, more a sort of observation. I think um, I think everybody in this room is going to be affected by something the OU's done for Moodle, uh, and so it's been really nice going through that sort of timeline. I think Moodle owes the OU an awful lot, so thank you very much. We use your tools, and I think we wouldn't be able to do some of the stuff without some of the contributions you guys have made over the last 10 years, so more of a thank you than a question. Well, yeah, thanks. <laughs>that's a lovely note to end on uh, thank you very much yeah. thank, thank you very you. much so everybody um, just again just take some time to, to appreciate Jenny's talk thank you very much